My name is Jeremy Fish, and I am a San Franciscan for the last 26 years, and a, someone who was fortunate enough to make their living drawing pictures in the most expensive city in the United States. Hello, and welcome to Storied San Francisco. I'll be your host, Jeff Hunt. In this podcast, you'll get to know artist Jeremy Fish. Jeremy begins by tracing his family line back to both of his grandfathers, qualities of whom he sees in himself. Jeremy was born in Albany, New York, but raised mostly in Saratoga Springs, just a bit further upstate. Mostly through skateboarding magazines, he was fascinated with San Francisco, and when it came time to go to college, he chose the SF Art Institute. The story of Jeremy and his dad's visit to check out the school is one you really gotta hear. Jeremy ends the podcast sharing his story of leaving the city after he graduated from SFAI, leaving only to return a short time later. I have to say, Jeremy was kind enough to invite me and Michelle into the Doolin Larson building, an SF heritage home at Hayton Ashbury that Jeremy is doing a residency in. I had a little trouble concentrating during the recording because the house is just so incredibly beautiful and fascinating. For photos of the home, please go to our website or check our socials. Here's Jeremy. My mother's grandfather, uh, Albert D'Agostino, moved to this country from Italy to be a tailor in New York City. And he was the personal tailor for Teddy Roosevelt and made the suit, I mean, among others, uh, made the suit that he was married in and the suit that he was buried in. Wow. Um, and so my grandfather, who was also an artist, uh, went to Cooper Union and studied art and unfortunately the depression hit and his mother passed away and so my grandfather very quickly uh, had to like get a real job and drop out of art school. <laughs> he eventually uh, kind of ran away and went to Los Angeles to work for his uncle. Was he uh, single at the time? Yes. Okay. Before he met my grandmother and uh, I'm sorry uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. He went to he went to Los Angeles to work for his uncle, who was an art director for RKO Pictures. Okay. And I screwed up the names. His uncle's name was Albert Diagostino, um, okay. not his father. Okay. And you'll see his uncle's name in credits for a bunch of old cowboy movies. Um, my grandfather got a job in Los Angeles painting sets and being kind of a handyman. Uh, this is in like the thir 30s or so? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And uh, has a bunch of really great stories from them. And I would say probably primarily, my grandfather's probably, the, my mother's father, uh, Nick D'Agostino, is probably the single biggest influence in my life. Okay. Uh, he wore a lot of brown and later on in life became a carpenter and a master woodworker and made a living with his hands in like a room in the back of my grandparents' house. And I, that had a heavy influence on me. My father's dad, uh, whose name was Marion Merton Fish, who went by Bud, was a traveling knife salesman for Buck Knives. Okay. And was just always the funniest guy in the room, as you'd have to be as a traveling salesman <laughs> in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Uh, Specifically to knife sales or yeah, just any? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any, no, okay. he sold knives for Buck <laughs> Knives for like decades. Where um, was he based? Upstate New York. My whole family is from like Western New York. Got it. I was born in Albany, New York, okay. but um, my mother and my father's family all, they, my mother and father met in Western New York uh, in smaller cities near Binghamton, which is kind of the largest SUNY school near where they are. Okay. Um, so yeah, my, my mother's father and my mother's side of the family all made their living using their hands and their minds. And my father and his father made their living. My father was a public relations guy for uh, and um, for a giant company in the steel industry in Pennsylvania most okay. of his career. And his dad, like I said, was a traveling salesman. So it's kind of like half of my toolkit is my father's side of the fish side of the family, which like made their living chatting with people and you know selling things and verbally. You know, mm -hmm, and my, mm -hmm. my mother's side of the family made their living with their hands. And so okay. everybody in my family thinks I got kind of half of both sets of cards because you can't really be a self-employed artist by yourself without being able to talk about it or tell someone why they should bother to work with you. Right. Um, 
And then it becomes how you do it. Like, exactly. Don't, just don't be slimy. Yeah, or be a prick. Right. It makes it hard if people hate you. Yeah, just be real. Or do the best you can. Yes. And so, uh, yeah, I, I wasn't ever very good at anything else. Um, hmm. I was pretty good at art, and I was pretty good at skateboarding. And I really uh, wasn't ever very good at anything else. And so when it came time to go to college, my father insisted that I go to art school for something that I could actually get a job doing. Right. Um, like, like, I mean, guess advertising or no, something like that? Something, or... well, he didn't, def- he didn't define it. He okay. just said, study something that actually has a job attached to it. Right. And I had screen printed in uh, high school and again, again in college. My, my neighbor growing up, this guy, Sean O'Donnell, had the contract for Ben and Jerry's in the 80s. Okay. And so a lot of kids in my neighborhood and friends of mine would... Uh, screen print and tie-dye shirts for Ben and Jerry's in this guy's garage. And it was just something I knew you could do to make a living. Um, I used to do it in my basement for me and my circle of friends. And it was just something that was a practical application of a form of art that I was really drawn to. Right. And so it was when I moved here uh, in 94, I was partially drawn to San Francisco because the Art Institute, SFAI, uh, had a screen printing department. Okay. And the city itself was the skateboard capital of the world in the mid-90s. Absolutely. And so it was like, I could come here, and I was never good enough athletically to become professional, but I was good enough athletically that I wanted to come and see, you know, some of the best natural terrain on earth totally. when I was still young enough and had the knees to enjoy it. Did you did you mostly grow up in Albany before you came here? or? I was born in Albany, and my family moved around a lot. I, okay. pre- I went to uh, junior high and high school in a city called Saratoga Springs. Oh, yeah. Which is the San Pellegrino of the United States. <laughs> okay. And also, I mean, it's famous for its water. Water, Ponce right. de Leon or whatever thought it was the fountain of youth. Okay. Uh, and it's also really crooked. It's run by, the, well, yeah. it's been primarily run by the mob its entire existence. Yeah. And it's where like Dutch Schultz and Meyer Lansky and guys like that buried their money back in the day. Okay. It was the midpoint for uh, during Prohibition for smuggling alcohol from Canada. Okay. Because it's equidistant to Montreal and Manhattan. Right. So if you'll see, whenever you have any reason to be in Saratoga Springs, you'll notice a lot of freestanding brick garages, where in the middle of the night they drive in and park the liquor and stay there and party, and then in the middle of the night drive it the rest of the way to Manhattan. That's so rad. Yeah, super rad. Not did that, you, not, did you that know? Ra- not that rad when you're a kid, actually. Right. But to be fair, uh, Saratoga Springs has the oldest continuous running racetrack in the United States, horse racing, okay. which is the life's blood of the city, yeah. tourism. Um, and it also, which is why it wasn't a bad place to grow up, has the oldest continuous running skate park in New York State. Oh, rad. Uh, that was built and opened in the 80s when I was little and is still there to this day. And although there are lots of parks in New York State, uh, it is the oldest one. Was it outdoor? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's, in a, it's in a public park. Well, that kind of leads me to another question I had. Um, and forgive my geographical ignorance, but um, did, did Albany or Saratoga Springs have hills? Yeah, Albany does. Okay. Big time. But um, nothing like here. No. Yeah. Uh-uh. Like no, no but more than, more than Saratoga did, and I, I moved from Saratoga after graduating high school to go to Albany to a two-year college. Okay. Um, I went to the Junior College of Albany for two years uh, in 93 and 94 mm-hmm. uh, before I moved here that same year. Okay. Um, and yeah. Uh, not much happened in Albany. I made a bunch of terrible art. Jimmy Fallon was my upstairs neighbor. Okay. Which is pretty rad. Sure. Uh, but yeah, I would say those are the greatest things that happened to me. I love Albany. It was a cool place to be born. Mm-hmm. In the 90s, uh, it made me realize I wanted something else than right. the Northeast. Like I right. needed to go further. And like I said, the San Francisco Art Institute was a calling to come here. They put Barry McGee on the cover of their catalog. And so when I went to like... Uh, Oh, you know, like a portfolio day where you look at schools to transfer to. I had always wanted to live here. I grew up reading Thrasher, and they painted this place to be this downhill mecca. Yep. And dudes like Tommy Guerrero made me yep. want to live here really yeah. bad. And so that coupled with the fact that they stuck Barry McGee on the cover of the catalog, and it was a done deal. Yeah. Um, I had learned about his artwork in different skateboard magazines and was a huge fan and just everything about it. There was this really amazing city that was 3,000 miles away, which was also handy because I was about as far as I could get from Albany. 
Right. Um, and so I took out a bunch of student loans and moved here in the fall of 94. Do you remember, um, so besides what you were seeing in skateboard magazines, may, I'm thinking maybe videos also, but like, you know, the skating world and then the art world specifically through the Institute. Do you remember any other sources of like how, how you would have known things about San Francisco growing up? Like you said, 3,000 miles away. Books, magazines, music. I was also really influenced by the hip-hop. I grew up in New York and have only ever listened to hip-hop my whole life. Uh, I mean, I listened to other things, but primarily um, that's what I grew up listening to since I was like eight. Okay. Um, the scene here at that time in the Bay Area was really progressive. I was really into Dell and the hieroglyphics. Yep. Uh, I just happened to move here like a couple months before they had that legendary battle on the radio between uh, the Hobo Junction and hieroglyphics. So it was like this culmination of three things that really influenced me creatively, um, skateboarding, art school, and hip hop that were all just having a real peaked moment in 94 in the city. So I just got lucky really. Like I made a good choice at a good time and came here when the city was really thriving and ripe and inexpensive. Part of the reason that I made the choice wasn't just all the things that I was excited about. My parents were enthusiastic because it was the cheapest of the three. I got into the SVA in New York and the Boston Museum School in Boston. Okay. And this was still cheaper to live in right. than both those cities at that time. So right. it was like, yeah, it was far away. But uh, I was saving money on a lot Relatively of... affordable. Yeah. Or at least, you know, more so than it is today. And right. I'm proud of that. Like, yeah. The fact that at the quarter century that I lived here, this went from being dramatically cheaper than either of those cities to being one third more expensive than Manhattan. Right. And it says a lot about this city and the things that happened here in the time I lived here. Absolutely. Do you remember your very first time to come here? Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. My dad was excited about me coming to school here. He got released from the Navy here and had just always had a warm attachment to it. In Alameda or? Oh, okay. I don't know exactly yeah. where they dumped him off. I'm just finding a lot of, because my dad's Alameda skating. Anyway, go ahead. I think Sorry. that, uh, you know, I, I actually couldn't even guess. Um, I just know that when he was released from the Navy, they, they sent out his Volkswagen Beetle and my mom and their dog. And everything was like dropped off here when he got released. And so they drove cross country and had this amazing adventure together. And my dad always really cherished his time in the Bay Area and like had real sentimental attachment to leaving the Navy and all these things. And so when I got accepted to this school, this was where he wanted me to go. My mother was not as enthusiastic. So my dad was like, my parents have been divorced since I was eight. And so they were kind of on either sides of the tennis court net of where I should be living and going to school. Also, do you have any siblings? Yeah, I have uh, my one older sister, okay, Amanda, who was at one time the youngest assistant district attorney in New York State and one of very few women to hold that position. Okay. So obviously she got all the brains. Yeah. Um, and you're this male, young, art, hip-hop loving, skateboarding kid, so your mom's like... Um, and, and also like a huge idiot, you know, like I barely got out of high school. I was not good at much. And right. the two things I wanted to go do were 3,000 miles away and not practical or sensible. Right. Especially when you're taking out enough student loans to ruin the rest of your life. Right. This is not a wise decision. And my mother is very much smarter than my father or I and like a lot more practical and just knew this was a stupid idea. Okay. Uh, so the first time I came was with him. We got a hotel in Fisherman's Wharf. We went and looked at this is a, such a good memory. So we went and looked at the school and, uh, you know, it was, it's amazing. It's the building was designed by Albert Brown, like the same yeah. architect that did Coit Tower and City Hall. I mean, the, the campus itself is dramatic. And, and another connection to Brown for you. Absolutely. Which I didn't realize till many years later. I mean, it has this giant Diego Rivera mural and it has this photo studio that was built designed by Ansel Adams and like you know Jesus. the place has a ridiculous history and it was pretty intimidating so while my dad and I went in for this interview and then he split and I was just kind of wandering around and you're you said you had gone to a little bit of college so you're like 19 20 I'm 19, 19 and I had just I was finishing my uh, second year at a junior college in Albany okay and in my hometown uh, is Skidmore College which is a pretty well-known like private school for like primarily like really wealthy kids from Connecticut and New York City, which is not a bad thing. That right. breeds really beautiful women. Right. And so my friends and I were we from the time I was in like junior high, we would go skateboard at Skidmore College and look at really beautiful, affluent young women. Okay. They were far out of our league. Right. 
uh, I also used to DJ at a lot of their college parties for extra money. And so I'm walking around this college campus here, 3,000 miles away from Skidmore, and this girl runs up and is like, holy shit, I know you. You DJ at a party at my house and blah, blah, blah. You were friends with this person or that person. And she said, what are you doing here? And I said, oh, I'm looking at the school. And she said, well, you know, I'm having a party later. Here's my number. Call me up. And so I left the school. There were a bunch of older dudes from where I grew up with that had moved here before me. Uh, one guy whose mom owned a skate shop in my hometown that I had worked at. Okay. So he offered to come and meet me and, like, show me around. So him and a bunch of other older dudes were, like, you know, I bombed down Hate Street for the first time and, like, caught the light and, like, did a bunch of, went to Fort Miley and did all these very important, just got to San Francisco kind of things. So that even if I didn't go to school here, I could feel like, oh, I saw some shit. Right. So I go skateboard with those dudes. Uh, you know, it's pre-cell phone. So I didn't, like, call my dad or anything. And I right. told him, like, hey, I'm going skateboarding with these dudes. Mm -hmm. I went skateboarding with him. And I called this girl. And I went to her house. And there was no party. And long story short, I woke up at her house. Oh, my God. And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> like, I'm on the other side of the city from Fisherman's Wharf. And my dad is in this hotel probably thinking I'm dead. Like, oh, you know, thanks for having me over. That was awesome. I got to go. And so I bolted across town. On your skateboard? Both, I think, skateboard and bus. Okay. Um, is a blurry thought I was going to get in a lot of trouble. Right. I didn't grow up with my dad, and I didn't know him very well. Okay. And I didn't want to piss him off, considering right. he was, I at this point, was needed to move here, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I got back to the hotel, expecting my dad to be pretty mad, and instead... He was like, what the fuck? He's like, you got laid your first night in San Francisco? This is fucking incredible. He's like, you're moving here. I don't give a fuck what anybody says. Like, yeah. He's like, we're making this happen. This is meant to be. Was he like, I want to move here too? No, nah, he was just like, I mean, this I just wasn't, happy. I wasn't of the same cut of dude as my dad. So yeah. I think for the first time ever, it was relatable. Like I'd had a relatable experience. Right. He couldn't imagine going down Haight Street at 40 miles an hour with all his friends but he did like the idea that I'd seen someone naked and hadn't yeah. been here 24 hours. Yeah. So, yeah, it was just one of those days that you can't forget. And I also didn't see the same significance in things that he did, but felt that I had already had this very small world experience in a city that was, you know, smaller than New York. And it has this more intimate thing happening here that I hadn't experienced. My only trips to major cities were Pittsburgh, was where my dad lived. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I traveled around pretty extensively with my dad and my grandfather around the Northeast. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'd never been anywhere that had this big city reputation with this very small town energy. You, I'm going to characterize your experience as like a skateboarder hip hop version of a sailor at a port of call. Yeah. You had your night and you're yeah. like, fuck yeah. And I was place. 19. I yeah, mean, 19. like that kind of experience. Amazing. It was very, very unique and unusual, and I was pretty weird looking, and like that was just a crazy thing to have happen. Okay. Um, all the way around. Weird looking how? Do you have pictures? I just was weird looking. Like I was a... Skater. Just not, I don't know. Kid. Like it was just a, I think that I just was very inexperienced at that point in my life in a million things. Like mm -hmm. I just hadn't really done much living, I don't think, right. at that age. So that particular experience was just really... It was a lot, like everything that happened here. I Absolutely. went out to eat in a bunch of restaurants I'd never really, you know, like yeah. the whole the whole program. Mm -hmm. The weather was really nice, and it was autumn, where back east it was already cold, and like just a whole long list of those things that you cherish when you've been here a while, and they don't wear off, but at that time they were really eye-opening. So that trip sealed the deal. Did you go back to get shit and move out, or did you... I was still finishing that school year. Okay. So yeah, I went back and finished out the school year and worked all summer to save money and then came back in the fall. When you did move here, uh, where did you live? Uh, well, I lived in a bunch of places temporarily. Okay. Uh, I crashed with a friend for the first few nights across the street from the cable car museum on oh, yeah. Mason. Yeah. In a really funny, like, ground-level apartment. Um, I wound up living in Lower Knob Hill primarily okay. for a while. Okay. It was walking distance to school. And mm -hmm. um, I had a lot of friends that had moved here just to skateboard um, who lived all in that area. And mm -hmm. it was right by Union Square, which at that time was a really, really popular place to skate. Right. Um, right mostly, and you'll probably be able to tell as this story unfolds, they say that the connections you make in college are the ones that propel you into your future mm -hmm. career. Mm -hmm. I didn't spend a lot of time at or with anybody at the Art Institute, which right. considering how much money I had taken out in loans 
was an incredibly stupid thing. Okay. But I think the thing I learned at the Art Institute is if it's, you know, it's one of the only fine arts driven institutions in the United States. And what they try to teach you is that fine art is holier than thou and that that is the most important form of art there is and that anything less than is less than. And that right. uh, I had a commercial arts background for a 19 year old. You know right. what I mean? Like I had done some t-shirts and painted some murals and pizza places and done some stuff growing up that to me I was proud of. Okay. And to say that that was less than these things they were trying to teach me about, which was like a giant white canvas with a red dot in the corner. You know what I mean? Like you're just right. like, what the fuck? Like, right. So I think I was turned off a lot by the curriculum as well as I had great instructors. I went to school with a ton of kids that were just spending somebody's money mm. partying and talking a lot about art, you know, mm -hmm. which is not to say that one is less than. It just mm. wasn't as attractive to me as going skating with my friends. And so I kind of, during that time that I was here the first two years, I built a large group of friends, just kids that I skated with. And, yeah. and again, I had friends in school, you know, like I'm not a prick. I got along with other kids and went to some stuff after school that was art school related. But definitely my circle of friends for the first two years was like 90% dudes that I met skateboarding and 10% right something that had to do with school. So it it did actually, uh, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because this part of the story is boring. It's fine. Um, but yeah, I mean, I got out of school. I didn't have any idea what I was going to do. I was pretty sure my time living here was over. This it is was like a, a couple of years later or... A year or two? I yeah. got here in 94 and I graduated in 97. It okay, took yeah. me a minute to like finish up, which should have just been two years. A lot of shit didn't transfer. And right. Two years and a semester later, I graduated in 97 okay. and just had no inkling I would stay here. I didn't even have any interest in it. My girlfriend that I had been with most of the time I had been here moved back to the East Coast and I kind of thought I would too just because it was, you know, time up. Yeah. You've borrowed money, you've come here, you've enjoyed it, but... The, the the dream is over it's time to hit reality and start paying back these loans mm -hmm. with a degree in screen printing from a fine arts institution which is almost completely useless right which was my dad's worst nightmare yeah. i had while in school i had been fortunate enough to land a job printing wallpaper in the mission okay. at a place that is now demolished and built into condos on 23rd and harrison that was called winfield wallpaper okay and it was a really old super high-end wallpaper company that by the 90s had been boiled down to just doing uh, like repair jobs. Like if you lived in an old mansion or you lived in a, or you worked in a casino or whatever, and some part of the casino had had a fire or someone threw up all over the wall or whatever, <laughs> our job would be to not only reproduce that, like redraw the damask and like reprint it, but then print like filters and shit over top of it to look like you'd smoked in like there for worn. 40 years or someone threw up on it or whatever. <laughs> right. Um, and that was a great job. That lent me a lot more technical screen printing skills. Okay. Uh, I got way more engaged in it in college because of that job. And my focus went from painting almost entirely over to screen printing, which is what my degree was in. Because, like I said, I knew it was something I could get a job doing. Right. So I got out of school. I put my stuff in storage here. I went on a long road trip. Uh, I wound up in Portland, Oregon, staying with some friends. Uh, it was a great road trip the summer I graduated college. I had organized it with a bunch of my childhood friends to like, you know, this is pre-internet. Right. You got a list of the skate parks in the United States out of the back of Transworld, I think it was. So I took the guide out of the back of Transworld and my friends and I planned a road trip around the United States to hit what were, at that time, like the best parks in the country. Yep. We had decided we would dress up as the A-team over do. beers the night before we left. <laughs> And so when I showed up the morning of, I was, I'd fully shaved down to a mohawk with attached beard, clip-on feather earrings, a cut-off jean jacket, and a pair of red sweatpants. You were BA. I was oh, going to ask who, who got to be <laughs> And no one else followed through at all. And I was, oh, fuck! I was mad because you can't, I mean, no. you can't just shave your head. And I just, I didn't want to let it go. So I, I stayed in the, in the Mr. T costume. And by the time we got to Chicago, we were at this skate park in, I think, Rockford, Illinois. Okay. And one of the dudes that worked there was a BMX dude. And he was like, you know, he's like, I'm really feeling your tribute to Mr. T. Mm -hmm. He's like, I just did a BMX demo at his house, and it's like 20 minutes from here. And we were all like, wait, what the fuck? So he told us how to find it, and he had to go pre-internet. And right. he's, like, he's like, you'll know it's his house because he chopped down all the trees on his property. 
and it just left the stumps just to piss off his rich neighbors. <laughs> and he lives in like a gated mansion community right. outside of Chicago. So sure enough, we got to his house and I rang the doorbell and there was someone there and they were definitely looking at us through a camera, but we did not get to go in and smoke a joint with Mr. T, which uh. was my bucket list for that summer. So anyway, I yeah. uh, wound up in Portland, got a job out of the phone book, screen printing nameplates for Bank of America. Okay. I worked in a warehouse all by myself and every morning they would fax a list of names and it would be like, you know, Gary Witherspoon. Just super white Topeka, names. Kansas. No. <laughs> oh, no. All, I mean, Bank of America, dude. All kinds of people were. Oh, there. I thought you meant just for that one. No, and no, no. It was like whole... nationally. Oh, got it. Uh, so I would just like print out names, screen print one little nameplate, wrap it up and mail it to that branch. Oh, my God. Uh, it was one of the most mundane jobs I'd ever had in my life. And I thought, if this is what you go to art school to get, I'm fucked. You know, right. this, is, this is awful. And then sure enough, out of nowhere, one of my really good friends, Dustin Wengreen, had worked in the skateboard industry in their print shop. Like, he was the assistant manager of the place that prints all the t-shirts and stickers and skateboards directly uh, for, the, for the Northern California skateboard industry for like Deluxe and Think. Yeah. Um, and his boss just up and quit. Okay. And they promoted him to running the whole print shop, which is like a place with, at the time it had like 45 employees and was responsible for making thousands of skateboards a week. Uh, and he was just like, he called me and was like, holy shit. He's like, I just got handed the reins to this place. You should take over my job and be the assistant manager. And this music came on and it was like, dun, dun, dun. Like I fucking did it. And I moved back down here and got a job and worked in the skateboard industry for like 10 years. And would that have, what year would that have been that you came back? 97. It was the oh, same the year same, I graduated. Oh, okay. I probably, maybe there's probably some overlap and I don't know exactly what started when, but I graduated in the, you know, I think I graduated in the winter and got the job. I don't, I don't remember exactly when it went down. But That's like, late, late 90s. Late 90s. Yeah. And I worked there. Uh, I worked in the print shop for a really long time and slowly started to, like, give them designs. Mm -hmm. Like, Thrasher let me do a T-shirt and Juxtapose mm -hmm. let me do a poster. Mm -hmm. And, uh, like, I had a poster for sale on the back of Juxtapose in, like, 98. Nice. And no one had ever seen anything I'd ever done before. But, right. like, I just, they really, the people there really liked me because I was cooperative and, made sure all their designs printed well and they knew i was i was having little art shows on my own like outside of work and um slowly but surely the skateboard brands let me do graphics and like you know i was working at my own stuff at night when i get home from the print shop mm -hmm. people that live with me in my apartment there was an extra room in the back that they all let me use as a studio so i was generating work after i got home for years like wow. Probably for like three years, I would have little art shows and like make little designs and print them at work. Yeah. Um, the guys that owned the place knew and they got wind of it. And at first they were annoyed, then they grew to like it, then they grew really supportive. And at some point they were like, we're gonna pull this guy out of the print shop and put him in an art department. Okay. And that was the last job I had. That was Jeremy Fish. On the next episode of Storied San Francisco, Jeremy will finish the story of his life and reflect on changes he's seen in the city in the quarter century he's lived here. Check back Thursday for part two. Music for Storied San Francisco is by Otis McDonald. Photography is by Michelle Kilfeather. The show is hosted and produced by me. Michelle and I have produced more than 130 episodes over the last three years and you can find them all at our website, storiedsf.com. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, where you can like, comment, and share the stuff we put out. Find the podcast just about everywhere you can listen, including, most recently, BFF.FM's new podcast network. Please subscribe to stay up to date on all the content we publish. We love feedback, so if you have any, our email is storiedsf at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening. Stay strong, stay safe, and stay healthy. This podcast is a proud member of the BFF.FM podcast network. Learn more at podcasts.bff.fm. BFF.FM, best frequencies forever.